So hello everybody, this is Bhante Joe here, and I'm actually just here in Colombo right now and thought to record a short Dhamma discussion for the internet. So I thought that could start with just a little meditation, so it can lean forward a bit and arch the spine, and look about three feet in front, and close our eyes. And can focus in on the breath, can know when it's coming in, and know when it's going out. If we breathe in a long breath, can just know I'm breathing in a long breath. And if we breathe in a short breath, can just know I'm breathing in a short breath. and can just pose the question in the mind. What would be a really comfortable way to breathe right now? And one can just let one's body respond on its own. and can focus in on the breath at the tip of the nose and when watching the breath at the tip of the nose it can be good to try to make mindfulness as continuous as possible being aware all the way through the in-breath <coughs> as the in-breath turns to the out-breath <coughs> all the way through the out-breath and as the out-breath turns back to the in-breath again. Trying to make mindfulness as continuous as possible. And if the mind wanders off, can just bring it back to the present moment, to the breath. And before we finish meditating, can spread thoughts of goodwill, wishing may all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. And we can make the mind infinite, can make it unbounded, all the way to the ends of the universe and beyond in every dimension. May all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease.
and you can open eyes and do a short Dhamma discussion for the internet. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang sarananga chami dhammang sarananga chami sangang sarananga chami Dityampi buddhang sarananga chami dityampi dhammang sarananga chami dityampi sangang sarananga chami Tatiampi buddhang sarananga chami tatiampi dhammang sarananga chami tatiampi sangang sarananga chami So I hope this finds everyone well wherever they might be and I've actually just come down here to Colombo which is the main uh, city in Sri Lanka, uh, the largest city in Sri Lanka, and uh, I've been uh, getting some Ayurvedic medicine, so that's been uh, it's been nice. And so I was asked a question the other day by a gentleman, maybe a couple weeks ago or so, uh, which was, what are the benefits to lay people observing the eight precepts, both to themselves and the community around them? And uh, is it beneficial to keep them only on observance days? So basically the eight precepts, or uh, we might call sila in general, is, uh, is something that basically gives space in the mind for meditation to grow. I remember when, when my, uh, my grandfather, when he was young, he said there was all the, in Canada, there, there was all these very tall and humongous trees at that time. And they wanted to make these fields to grow crops. And so in order to have the space to grow crops, they had to cut down the trees and uh, uproot the stumps and then uh, basically prepare the soil, I guess, for, uh, for farming. And so land was there, the land, the land was there, there were trees on the land and, so if, and they were quite large, so if one tried to plant crops, say, in between the trees, it might not be that successful. And maybe a few plants would grow here and there where there was sunlight. And in a similar way, when one's mind is caught up with the things of the world, there's not so much space for one's meditation to grow. One can put in the same amount of time, the same amount of effort, but without the aspect of renunciation, there's not uh, space, not so much space in the mind for meditation to grow into. There's there's already quite a lot of things growing there. (laughs) So the eight precepts take the five precepts, which are kind of moral precepts, which basically... Uh, is what makes one a human, more or less, in, the, in Buddhist thinking. And they add on renunciant precepts. They add on not eating afternoon. They add on not basically engaging in entertainment, adornment, and uh, beautification. And uh, the first precept gets changed uh, to celibacy. And they add on not sleeping on higher luxurious beds. So you're not supposed to sleep on a bed that's higher than this. And so the the cumulative effect of those precepts is that they basically take one away from the world. And kind of one, especially with entertainment, one is, uh, one is not engaging in most of the things that people in the world engage in. So it basically pulls one back, pulls one back from one's friendships. And if one is celibate, then it pulls one's back from a lot of one's uh, relationship with the things of the world, one might say. So these precepts create space in the mind for one's meditation to grow. So if one has this kind of attitude or this intention of renunciation, then it can be a little bit painful at first, kind of giving things up. But what it does is it allows one's meditation to progress. It's in the giving up of those things. That's like the cutting down of the trees that allows one to plant the crops, that allows one to have space in the mind, space in the mind to plant seeds and space for those seeds to grow. So this is one of the biggest benefits to keeping the eight precepts uh, for oneself. Kind of one basically has space in the mind for one's meditation to progress. As far as the benefits that one might have for others is basically what it does is it provides an example to other people um, in the world because one is still a lay person that one can be happy, one can find happiness that doesn't depend on entertainment, that doesn't depend on uh, having like a big house uh, or you know fast car or whatever it might be that one can find sources of happiness that don't cost money <laughs> don't really cost money I mean, one has to have food <laughs> 
But beyond that, one can find these sources of happiness for free and that are at one's disposal and that other people can't really take away. So this is the example one provides to one's community or the community at large in keeping the eight precepts. It's kind of that, that it's possible to find these sources of happiness. And of course, one also provides quite a lot of peace to people at large. It's kind of one has said when one keeps the five precepts, when one stops... Uh, stealing and killing and if one is faithful and doesn't take intoxicants, one provides this kind of unlimited ease to different beings in, in various ways because they no longer have to worry that one is going to go out and kill them <laughs> uh, and these kind of things. So in a similar way, these renunciant precepts actually, they foster another sense of ease in the mind for uh, for people in the world at large. There's a kind of edginess that comes with needing to engage in entertainment, with needing to dress up and put on makeup and make oneself look attractive, with needing to sleep on really luxurious places, live in really luxurious places. Actually, when one sleeps on the floor, it, it kind of doesn't really matter if one is living in a mansion or, <laughs> or a shack. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of uh, all the same. One is, uh, one is on the floor. So... In this way, one provides this kind of uh, this kind of ease to people. You know, people don't have to worry that one is uh, scheming on them so much that one's relationships with them are for something false, like that one wants to get more out of them. Uh, people don't have to worry about that so much. Um, uh, when one keeps these renunciant precepts, when uh, one basically strips oneself off from from these various things, from the various engagements of the world. And what that means is that people who engage with one don't have to worry that one is using them to get the various things of the world. So those are a couple of benefits to the community at large. And also, uh, as far as keeping them, when to keep them, the, the precepts are something that uh, you basically, whenever one keeps them, they're a benefit. The, the traditional time is to keep them on the moon days, so the half moon, the full moon, and the new moon. And this basically adds up to about once a week. So about once a week, one is not eating afternoon. About once a week, one is uh, not engaging in entertainment. And in a Western calendar, a solar calendar, they come up kind of randomly. So sometimes they come on the weekend, sometimes uh, they come uh, during the week, kind of shifts gradually throughout the year. And so what that means is that there's going to be all these various times uh, in the week where one is basically pulled back and uh, not engaging in these things. So basically it takes one's lifestyle a step back. So to do that one, one day a week is good. If one does it more days a week, two or three days a week, then that's even better. <laughs> that will pull one's uh, lifestyle back even more. And these, the keeping of these precepts is said to be something very beneficial. It's basically something that uh, generates the kama for one to go to heaven. But uh, from, a, from a perspective of a meditator, the more one keeps them, the more they become one, part of one's lifestyle, the more renunciation becomes part of one's lifestyle, the more room there is to try to find refuges that are not external, to try to find a refuge that's internal, to try to find... Uh, refuge in meditation, try to find refuge in the practice of the Dhamma. And this, of course, is to find a higher refuge. It doesn't depend on anything at all. But so long as one keeps these eight precepts, the more one does, the more space one has in the mind. It's like if, uh, to use the example from uh, my grandfather's time, if there was, I don't know, a three-acre plot that was totally covered with uh, humongous trees, if one clears uh, one-seventh of that plot, then one has one-seventh <laughs> of the space to grow more crops. If one clears half of that crop plot, then one has half of that space to grow crops. If one clears the whole plot, then one has uh, the whole space to grow crops. And so, in a similar way with a rough metaphor, if one keeps the eight precepts one day a week, it's a good thing. One clears a certain amount of space in the mind. If one keeps them half the week, it's even more. And if one keeps them the full week, it's even better. Bit of a rough metaphor. So. The more the better, as long as one can do it, as long as one uh, is able to uh, lean back on one's meditation for support, as long as one has the zeal and effort to do that in the Dhamma, then one can benefit from that. So those were a few questions regarding the eight precepts. So I think that will leave that for reflection and wishing all the blessings of Dhamma practice.